Now, since we finished chapter 7 uh, last summer, we'll start mainly at chapter 8. And I say mainly because chapter 8 is so important. Chapter 8 uh, contains what's known as kind of the high mark or the high water mark in the Gospel of Mark. Um, the, chapter 8 contains the feeding of the 4,000 contains a scene where the Pharisees demand a sign, contains a discussion of the leaven of the Pharisees, a blind man is healed, and the high watermark or the high point is Peter's confession. Who do others say that I am, but who do you say that I am? Remember, we'll get to that next week. Jesus foretells his death and resurrection. This is the first of three times he declares that. He reminds the, his disciples that he will, uh, be, um, he will die, he will be buried, and he will be resurrected. People still coming in. Come on in. Yep. So this morning I want to begin by reminding us what the central truth of the gospel is, and that is that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One, the Son of God, God the Son, who took on human nature to accomplish salvation. Remember one of the central themes of the Gospel of Mark is who is Jesus? In 1 John 4, it says, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Verse 15, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. So, why study the Gospel of Mark? Well, the material is familiar. People in this room probably, and I know, even have taught the Gospel of Mark before. So it's very familiar material. It's short. It's fast moving. It's not a biography. We don't know what Jesus' favorite color was. We don't know what he worried about. We don't know how he dressed. We don't, it's not a biography. These scenes are selected by Mark to prove a point. And that is, these scenes are historical and accurate. They're historical theologies, or they're histories with a theological emphasis. In John 20, Now, Jesus did many other, th other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So, what's happened is, Mark is taking scenes, compiling them, describing them, so to prove a point. What's the point? The struggles he had with the Pharisees, the doubts that the, the disciples continued to have, uh, the wonder of his healing power, uh, even, and we'll see even uh, today, uh, his impatience with the, um, with the slow, kind of the spiritual sluggishness of the, of the uh, disciples. Continuing with John 20, but these are written, why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. That's what we're doing here. We're studying the Word so that we may believe by the power of the Spirit and have life in His name. Now Mark wrote his Gospel for believers in Rome, generally who were Gentile believers in Rome. It was a small church. Uh, some scholars uh, suggest that the, the um, church was beginning to dwindle some because some of the uh, eyewitnesses had, been, had started to die off and how was, how was the next generation going to 
are going to hear the gospel and, and, and hear the truth and then um, um, be encouraged and grow in their faith. It's time to write this down. Mark was the first one to do it. In this class, we want to discover Jesus maybe in a deeper way. We want to be refreshed with the thrilling news of the gospel. And as we, as we go through it, we'll, we'll see it. It'll be so, so vivid to us. To be strengthened in our faith as we travel with Jesus from place to place. We'll tell, he's going to go three separate places this morning. And we're going to watch him interact in ministry with Jews and with Gentiles. One of the themes of this morning's class, and the Mark is, is, is uh, moving in this direction in his gospel, proving that Jesus has a heart for the nations, not just the Jews. Most of his ministry in Mark is consider, is, happens in, not in Jerusalem, but in Galilee and in Gentile territory, like the Decapolis region and into Tyre and Sidon. Mark will make a contrast between insiders and outsiders, those who see and those who are blind, those who believe and those who don't. And sometimes he says, don't tell other people about my miracles. What's the deal there? He has a timetable. He and his father have a timetable for, uh, for carrying out the plan of salvation. We can't study Mark without being confronted with the truth, without pondering what Jesus is teaching us. And we can't do it without sifting and engaging with the truth. Mark is the earliest gospel written, maybe after 20, 25 years after Jesus ascended. It was written in Rome. The order of the New Testament books, James is likely to be the first, then first and second Thessalonians, then first and second Corinthians, in about A.D. 55, and then Mark's Gospel. After that comes Galatians, Colossians, Romans, Philemon, Philippians, and all the way uh, through to the rest of the uh, New Testament. Remember, Mark was not an apostle. He was younger than the disciples. He's not even identified as the author, except that strange time in the Garden of Gethsemane when he follows Jesus and the crowd to, and sees Jesus arrested, and they turn around and say, he's one of them, and they go after him, and he's only got his bedclothes on. They grab it, he drops it, and he runs away, presumably naked. Mark lives in his mother's house in Jerusalem. And it's a fairly big house, apparently, because there was room in that house for the Jerusalem church to meet for prayer. Mark was related to Barnabas. They went on a missions trip, the first missions trip with Paul, and then they, they, uh, Mark said, I've had enough of this, I'm going home. And that caused a split between Paul and John Mark. Also John Mark. Here, John Mark would call it, but I'll say uh, Mark. He linked up with Peter, probably in Jerusalem. Remember, he's younger than the disciples. Peter kind of takes him in. And Peter then becomes the eyewitness for the scenes that Mark describes in his gospel. Okay. Peter even calls him, in 1 Peter 5, calls Mark, my son. 
So there was a close relationship between Peter, the apostle, and John Mark. A major theme in Mark is Jesus is portrayed as a servant in Galilee and beyond, and he was portrayed as a savior who goes to Jerusalem to suffer and to die. Today's passages, starting in chapter 7 and going through the middle of chapter 8, mark the beginning of a transition in Jesus' ministry from Galilee. Galilee is that area north of the Lake of Galilee. It's an area that is clustered with some 240 villages, towns and villages. It's very, uh, it's easy to, to get and a short distance to travel from one place to another. That's Galilee. Galilee um, has a, sea, has a uh, fishing uh, industry kind of at the center uh, of it. Um, and uh, he will go from kind of going from place to place in Galilee. And then after the Galilean ministry is over, he's going to head to Jerusalem. And the rest of Mark describes Jesus' experience in Jerusalem. So he's wrapping up his ministry in Galilee, about to head south to Jerusalem. But before he heads south, he's going to take the disciples into clearly Gentile areas. He's going to go to Tyre and Sidon. These are um, cities and, and port cities at the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, Tyre and Sidon. That whole area is known as Phoenicia. Um, it's in Lebanon today. It's a seacoast town. There are a bunch of sailors in there. There's a whole industry built around fishing and, sh and shipping and all of that. This is an industrial, sinful, pagan area dominated by Gentiles. What in the world is Jesus going up there for? The disciples wonder. Well, that's his first stop. And the next stop is in another Air Gentile area known as the Decapolis region, which is on the other side of the, um, of the uh, Sea of Galilee. Now, the reason I want to do this is we're going to start in 7, so you can turn to chapter 7, verse 24. Chapter 7, verse 24. We're going to go quickly through the faith of the Syrophoenician woman. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre in Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile a Syrophoenician by birth. Now, remember, Phoenicia is that whole uh, eastern seaboard uh, of the Mediterranean Sea. So why Syro? Because it was ruled by Syria to the north. It's a Syrophoenician woman. That's where that term comes from. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Now, Tyre is some 25 miles northwest of Capernaum. Capernaum was kind of Jesus' um, center of, um, um, of operations in uh, Galilee. Um, about 20 miles north, of, and then, then Sidon, you have Tyre, then you have Sidon about 20 miles north of that. 
and it would take at least a week to get to Tyre on foot from Capernaum. So imagine now he's, where he's had crowd after crowd after crowd, he's now craving or intending to have some private teaching time for his disciples. And one way to do that is to go away from Capernaum and go away and take his, uh, his disciples with him. I forgot to say, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call them synoptic Gospels because they take the same point of view, that sin means com coming together, optical means how we view it. So uh, these are synoptic Gospels in the first three. And there's a parallel, and, and we'll refer to them, there are parallel passages in Matthew uh, for what we will study uh, in Mark. Matthew, when he talks about the Syrophoenician woman, calls her a Canaanite woman. Galilee, he's been in Galilee with his disciples for about two years now. Crowds were troublesome. He wanted to avoid a premature clash with hostile Jews. And Herod even was a growing threat. Word was getting around. The Gentile woman whose daughter was demon-possessed fell at his feet and begged Jesus to exorcise the demon. Sproul calls the area of Tyre and Sidon notoriously unclean. So you can imagine the discomfort that the disciples felt going with Jesus into this uh, Gentile area. The children in Jesus, uh, it sounds like cruel language, but uh, dogs are little pet dogs. Children are the Jews, they're, they're household dogs. They're not snarling um, dogs uh, that eat garbage in the streets. No, not that at all. Using a gentle picture of dogs, Jesus took the sting out of that term and he said to them, fed first. It's let the children be fed first, for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Well, what does that mean? If there's a first, there's likely to be a second, and maybe even a third, and maybe even a fourth. And there's a hint of Jesus' plan to spread, for the gospel to spread, the kingdom of God to spread um, in the coming um, uh, in, in the coming uh, months, years, and uh, ages, really. The woman picks up the metaphor of bread by, used by, remember when bread used to mean money? For the six, those of us in the 60s, who grew up in the 60s, bread, bread used to be money. But this is bread we're talking about here. What's a metaphor? A metaphor means we use something to refer, we mention something to refer to something else. Jesus says there's plenty of blessing to go around. We'll give it to the Jews first, and then surely some will be left over for the Gentiles. He looks at the woman and says, you have great faith, woman. You're willing to be, take the role of a pet dog and pick up crumbs because you know these crumbs are truth. They are the pearl of great price. They are, they are, um, they are life-saving wisdom, and she, she, it's the first time, presumably, that she'd ever met Jesus, but the word was getting around. He came to town, she knew it, and, and, he, uh, and she confronted him. She's an outsider in every way. She's from a foreign region. She lives in an area known for extreme paganism. She's a Gentile. But at the same time, she's an insider. Why? Because the Lord, the gift of faith, she sensed in power and forgiveness that Jesus paid her any attention at all, saying to us as we read it, no one is beyond the grace of God. The gospel of Jesus is for the whole world. Jews considered themselves to be the children of God. They are the only children of God. 
That's what they've been taught ever since they were babes. That's why for the, for the disciples, this is such a departure, such a discomfort uh, for them to be ministering to Gentiles. The woman knows something that even the disciples don't understand. She believes the kingdom will extend to all nations and nationalities. She wants and even expects grace from Jesus. Otherwise, why would she not, why, why would she beg him uh, on to, to come to, to heal her, um, her daughter? Like Jacob even. She wrestled with God until she received the blessing of the kingdom. She knows he doesn't deserve it, but she also knows that grace abounds and that Jesus has healed other undeserving folks. Sinclair Ferguson says, A Gentile woman seeking help for her daughter was thought by Jews of the day to be below the dignity of the true rabbis. Jesus is breaking the mold. The Pharisees would have despised her for who she was, just as their hard hearts had come to despise Jesus. But unlike the woman, the Pharisees had never been brought to see their need of Jesus. That turns out to be the greatest tragedy of their lives. Hardening of spiritual arteries is a fatal disease, says Ferguson. William Hendrickson, little daughter, he calls her little daughter, that's a, that's a term of tenderness. It would be a great privilege, the woman implies, to be treated like a pet dog. First, the door to salvation is open to non-Jews, even now. Jews go in first, then non-Jews, and she's fine with that. The woman's God-given faith is strong enough to realize that Jesus is not turning her away. She's overpowered by his love and tenderness, a compassionate attitude, which even his apparent sternness was unable to hide, says Hendrickson. The woman says, am I being compared to a pet dog? Well, I accept what is implied in the comparison. Not only do I accept it, I rejoice because of it, for certainly under the table these pet dogs eat some of the children's scraps. The woman displayed three Christian graces, faith, hope, and love. Faith in the love of God, hope knowing that, she would not, that he would not disappoint her, and love for Christ, the one who was refusing to turn her away, and who, though she loved him, had first loved Sproul says, Tyre and Sidon was a notoriously pagan area. Could not be hidden there and everywhere, even in the darkest corners of the world. The whole area was full of pagans and considered unclean by the Jews. She fell at his feet, paying homage and respect to Jesus, even though she'd only heard of him, and it was a desperate plea for Jesus' help. In Matthew 15, Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So we who were of non-Jewish descent are wild olive shoots grafted into the tree of Israel. Little dogs permitted to eat crumbs under the table. Would any of us trade the crumb of our salvation for anything in this world? That crumb is the pearl of great price. And Jesus gave it to the Syrophoenician woman. And he has given it to us. Moving on. Chapter 7, verse 31. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis, another Gentile region. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. 
And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephaphtha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Well, think about it. If he's, they proclaim it, he's, he's healed, and the word gets around, and a crowd begins to form. But as the crowd is forming, um, the, um, he goes through, plus, um, I must say, he, it was an indirect route. He was up on the eastern shore of Mediterranean. Now he's going to travel kind of southeast, but in a circuitous way, he's going to go this way kind of and end up down here in the Decapolis region. They call it Decapolis because it's, uh, it was made up of 10 Roman cities they put uh, together. But it's a desolate area. It's the same area. You remember um, the, um, the demon-possessed man who was chained and cut himself and um, lived among the, uh, the tombstones and, uh, and people were afraid of him. And Jesus, his first time in Decapolis, he's the one that, 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 removed, that, that uh, removed the demon. And he became soft and pliable. And, and he wanted to travel with Jesus. Jesus said, no, you go back into your town. And that's how we began to see that man, that healed man, as the first Christian missionary into, into a Gentile. So this is the area he's back in. He's in Decapolis. It's a desolate area, as opposed to the, the city in of Galilee, with all these 240 little cities and towns all kind of clustered together, easy to get from one to another. This is a desolate area. It's a long, indirect trip. But it does give Jesus a time to spend time with his disciples alone and that's where his focus is going to be now because he's going to prepare. He knows he's heading south ultimately to Jerusalem. He's going to take time now to spend with his disciples to teach them one-on-one -on -one in a small group, call it a seminar type uh, setting. And that's what he's after. And that's what we're going to see um, for the rest of, uh, of uh, Mark. Jesus walks the man away from the crowd. That tells the man that he has his full attention. I'm focused on you, buddy. He huddles with the deaf mute and a few disciples. Peter's among them. How do we, why? Because Peter is the source of this information, remember. Peter is describing it for Mark, who is transcribing it. Jesus uses sign language. He avoids distraction and publicity. He puts fingers into his ears. I'm going to focus. I'm going to do something here. And saliva on his tongue to build the man's confidence and to increase his faith. It's first ever this has happened to this man. Can you imagine what's going through his head and heart? Jesus points to heaven, groans deeply, a sign of deep feeling and compassion. Same word traveled, uh, translated groan in Romans 8, 23. When we don't know what to, what to pray, he understands our groanings, our deep, deep uh, groaning. Likewise, the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Ephatha is an easy, apparently an easy word to, rip, to lip read, be opened. He doesn't have to learn to speak. When he can speak, he says, don't tell anyone. And some people call that the messianic secret. So here's a deaf man who presumably hears immediately and already knows how to speak. Amen. 
Yeah, yeah. This is a question. This is a question from uh, from Bob Brown. Bob is pointing out that the, the, um, the intimate way that Jesus approached the deaf man in the Decapolis contrasted with the Syrophoenician woman whom, uh, and, uh, whose daughter Jesus healed without touching her at a distance. This time, there's a very intimate interaction between Jesus and the deaf man. That's what Bob is pointing out. And, and he's, he's saying that if the, the um, disciples were shocked with his behavior in Tyre and Sidon, they are really going to be shocked here uh, because it's so intimate. And there were a few with them. There were a, a few eyewitnesses with Jesus at the time. Karen. Karen is, Karen is pointing out well, how the, even the, the woman who had great faith and simply touched his garment and her bleeding stopped immediately and he felt immediately the power had gone out of him. Uh, that here's another interaction, powerful interaction, that doesn't require a physical touch. It was simply touching his robe. What's behind that? Her great faith. He turns around and says, your, your faith has made you well. Sinclair Ferguson calls the healing of the deaf man one of the most beautiful of healings. The sign language, Ferguson says, I'm going to remove the blockage in your ears. I'm going to unblock your tongue. He glances up to heaven. God alone is able to do this for you. It's not magic. It's God's grace. This is the message that Jesus is giving to the uh, deaf man. We can see in the miracle, we can see this miracle as a prophecy. When Jesus comes again, he will vanquish the powers of darkness. Until that day, we are all spiritually deaf and are barely able to stammer the praises of our Creator. It will not always be so. The day is coming when the stammerer will be eloquent and proclaiming his Father's praise, and the deaf will hear the voice of Christ with crystal clarity. Hendrickson suggests that Jesus saying, don't tell anyone, was like Tom Sawyer saying he loves painting this fence, or boys telling, uh, stealing apples when told not to, or Br'er Rabbit saying, don't, please don't throw me into the briar patch, which is exactly where that rabbit wants to go. Uh, well, uh, Bob Brown has a question about, um, about Hendrickson who says, don't tell anyone 
Jesus is saying to the uh, deaf man who was healed, was kind of like Tom Sawyer saying that he loves painting this fence or boys stealing apples when told not to or Br'er Rabbit saying, because it's going to be attractive. That's what he's saying. That don't tell anyone because it's going to be so attractive and I'm not ready to handle a crowd right now. That's essentially what he's, uh, what he's saying. But the effect is, whoa, the effect is I'm healed and I'm going to tell anybody who will listen to what, um, to what I have to say, to what I've been through, I've just experienced here. Instantly, this man, says Sproul, instantly this man could hear and speak clearly. His tongue was set free. Now, the same God who redeems us, redeems us well and makes us sing, Though great distress my soul befell, the Lord my God did all things well. To God all praise and glory. And that's hymn number four, verse six in our hymnal. So the Galilean ministry ends with ministry in Gentile areas. The Syrophoenician woman in Tyre and Sidon and the healing of the deaf man in Decapolis. The ministry in Tyre and Sidon and in Decapolis is a picture of the future church with a worldwide mission. It's a huge adjustment, as we pointed out, for the Jewish disciples. Touching a Gentile made Jews unclean. Keep away from them in the marketplace. Don't eat with them. Jews were the exclusive people of God. And if you didn't believe it, just ask them. Dust off their shoes if traveling in Gentile lands. But even the crumbs of the gospel truth are powerful for faith-filled sinners. Jesus does all things well. I love the way that uh, chapter 7 ends. It reflects Matthew 15, 31. They glorified the God of Israel. Imagine the Jews looking at the affection and, and rejoicing that the Gentiles, whom they uh, stay away from, are, are directing towards Jesus. They can't stand Jesus. They're, gonna out, they're out to get him, and they will uh, in, the, in, the coming, uh, in the coming verses. Let's go to chapter, 10, uh, chapter uh, 8, Mark 1 through 10. So now um, the Galilean ministry is coming to an end. He's heading south, but he's going he's to take a few turns before he uh, gets there. Mark 8, 1 through 10. I'll read it. In those days... When again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Remember? Uh, it's, it's called Decapolis, but it's a desolate area where they are on the southeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them, that is, the crowd. And they ate the crowd and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. He's on the southeast shore. Gentile area, right after this uh, feeding the 4,000, he gets in the boat again and he heads traveling northwest. He goes back to the Capernaum area, which is where the Jews are concentrated. So he's, that's, that's the trip that, uh, that Mark is describing.
Matthew has a parallel description. Matthew was probably there as an eyewitness. Mark wasn't there, remember, and got his details from Peter, who was also an eyewitness. Matthew, indeed, may have built on Mark's account. Remember, Mark's gospel is the first one to be written. Jesus takes the initiative with this crowd of 4,000. The disciples are skeptical. They must have forgotten about how he fed 5,000 in chapter 6. This is miraculous food again, creating edible food from nothing. Skeptics have said, scholarly skeptics have said, they just got it wrong in the gospel. It was all one, it was only a single miraculous feeding. And that just proves how unreliable these gospel accounts are. But there are differences between the two. And indeed, later in chapter, in verse 19, Jeter, as Jesus is teaching the disciples, he said, remember the 5,000, remember the 4,000? Clearly, these are two separate events and not a single one, a single event. What are the differences? The crowd is 5,000 and 4,000. A location, a desolate place around Bethesda on the northern shore versus the Decapolis, also called the country of the Gerasenes. The Jews were focused on the, uh, mainly Jews in the 5,000 crowd. Lost sheep of Israel, remember he calls them she uh, sheep without a shepherd. Mainly Gentiles down in the Decapolis. One day for 5,000, three days for 4,000. Jesus takes the initiative in the 4,000. I feel compassion for this crowd. Where in the 5,000, the disciples said, Teacher, what are we going to do with this crowd? There's no food here. So it came from them. But this time, Jesus says, I have compassion for this crowd. They've been with me for three days. Another difference between the two. In the 5,000 feeding, they filled up 12 baskets. What kind of, now that's a basket, one word in Greek, and another basket uh, for the 4,000, the basket in the 5,000 is a smaller basket. The basket in the uh, 4,000 is a larger basket. Um, it, it's the same word that they uh, used for, to help Paul escape from in, uh, Damascus, from over the wall. They lowered him in a basket of this size. So you can imagine, this is a big basket for the 4,000, a small kind of lunch basket for the, uh, the 5,000. Both feedings show Jesus' compassion. And remember what we talked about, compassion. Compa when you feel compassion, it leads you to action. You can't just look at it and walk away. Compassion is, it means you, literally, it means that you feel the pain of someone else. You feel, you, you, it's with, come, together, passion, pain. Um, compassion draws us into another person's suffering and leads us to action. Jesus showed compassion for the crowd. And not just Jews, but also for the Gentiles who were outside of the covenant. David Guzik says, Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Oh, what did you bring with you? And the disciples say, well, I've got, what, uh, was it seven? Is it... Um, he took the seven loaves. Now, um, bread first, and then the fish with separate blessings. It's not that way in the Matthew account, but it, it's not something that, that anyone can pay any attention to, to that, that can believe that that is a sign that these are unreliable uh, gospel accounts. Ferguson says this is a vivid lesson for the disciples. The gospel, here it is again, the gospel is for non-Jews, too. Miraculous feeding points to Jesus' all-defined, all-powerful nature. It's the same for us these days, says Ferguson. He blesses inadequate resources 
like us and uses us to bring his blessings to a needy world. Outreach in the name of Christ. Jesus is not limited in his power. He takes the weak things of the world to confound mighty things. Hendrickson. Crowds, again, there's that word again, the crowds had become common for Jesus. Lesson for the disciples, show compassion to others, show some initiative. Hendrickson wonders why the disciples didn't say to, to ask Jesus simply to say, okay, teacher, produce some food again and say to the crowd something like this, help is on the way. They don't say that. They didn't feel the compassion that Jesus felt for this crowd of 4,000. Hendrickson points out that they're not really loaves as we, as we think of loaf of bread. They are bread cakes, flat, kind of thin, easily to, uh, easy to break into small pieces. So when did the miracle occur? Maybe as Jesus kept breaking the bread and kept giving it to his disciples. John MacArthur says, the, and he, he always goes back to the Greek, just as Hendrickson does. He says, the, the tense of these verbs are, are is, it's, it showed compassion and deep, deep feeling on Jesus' part. Bread cakes from grain that has never grown, never mixed into dough. Never had leaven put into it to make it rise. This is edible food out of nothing. Fish that never lived, never swam, were never caught, cleaned, and cooked. Food to satisfy, created from nothing. Over and over, says MacArthur, in the Greek verb, it says it kept giving, he kept giving, he kept giving, he kept giving. Key lesson here for the disciples, mercy and salvation are also for the Gentiles. Mark 11 to 13, let's keep going. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Jesus has about had it with these Pharisees. He has run out of patience. Soon as he gets back to the Jewish area of the Sea of Galilee, Dalmanutha, a little south of Capernaum, as soon as he does that, the Pharisees, and Matthew says the Sadducees were working with the Pharisees together, and that's... that's a real surprise because they were, they did not get along. Pharisees and the Sadducees confront Jesus with verbal attacks. This is not just, what did you do? This is haranguing in the Greek. This is attacking. This is bullying with a big B. Jesus turns around and says, you can't interpret the signs of the of the times, they don't recognize Jesus' miracles as signs that the kingdom of God is at hand. They don't see it. All of history in the Old Testament has pointed to Jesus the Christ, and they were well aware of the Old Testament scriptures. But that Jesus is the Christ is how Mark opens his gospel. And that theme continues throughout the book. Both groups 
Pharisees, Sadducees, and the disciples were still looking for the physical, political Messiah. Unless he can rise up and throw off the Roman yoke, he's a fake. Jesus sighs. He's sick and tired, out of patience, exasperated. He's had enough with these hostile skeptics. No signs for this generation, evil and adulterous generation, is said in Matthew, except for the resurrection sign of Jonah. That is, who three day buried for three days, and is and uh, is resurrected sign of Jonah after three. They're demanding a sign from heaven. By doing that, they're rejecting Jesus's ministry and all of his previous signs. Hard hearted Pharisees and Sadducees. Ferguson says the Pharisees demand a, uh, demand a sign from heaven. Earthly miracles are not enough. They want to see something like fire from heaven, Elijah and the Baals. Stop the sun, Joshua and the Amorites. Stop the storm with the disciples. Remember that, that mega storm that he stopped? That's what they want to see. Not a healing from that takes place right on the surface of the earth. Guzik said, this is not a friendly encounter. They were really after him. Miracles are not done to convince hard-hearted non-believers. Miracles in Jesus' experience and, and what we read about, healing, restoring withered limbs, miraculous feedings, cleansing lepers, that has shown the power of God in mercy. Hendrickson. Arguing, tempting Jesus with hardened hearts. This generation, that means the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, the cohort of leaders, you're not going to get a sign of the type that you're asking for. Jesus gets into the boat, leaving the Pharisees to their own sin and heading across. Now, that's important because Jesus is at the limit of his patience. He leaves in a hurry. The disciples presumably leave with him in a hurry. They get into the boat. This time they head from the Capernaum area northeast to the area of Bethsaida. It's a fishing town, home of Peter and Andrew and Philip. Let me read this quickly. Now they had forgotten to bring bread. Why? They're, they're in a hurry. Come on. Jesus says, come on, guys. No time for that. Get in this boat. I've had it with these guys. And he, he hit, so they, they, they had forgotten to bring bread. And they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. This is a complicated conversation. Follow it with me. And Jesus, aware of this, that is aware of what they were talking about, they were really exercised about this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? He's coming down hard on his disciples. That's what he's after, though. This face-to-face, -face, 
seminar-type exchange with his disciples to train them for the larger mission that they are responsible for carrying out when he is gone. Jesus knows the discussion. They're talking about bread. I thought you got it. No, I didn't, I didn't have time to get it. You only, we only got one and we're 12? We shouldn't have bought it before we left Capernaum because we're likely to be in a desolate place again. These disciples were worried about bread. It's a strange conversation. Two different subjects. Jesus has the Pharisee encounter on his mind. Remember, he's worked up about that. His disciples are focused on bread. Jesus says to them in the middle, says, watch out. They seem to ignore his comment and continue to discuss their lack of bread. Whose fault is it? What are we going to do now? Jesus gives, him, gives them withering questions. He's not, he's not backing off. He's coming on really strong to his disciples. These questions, the disciples want to say, no. Are you blind but don't see? No, we see. They want to answer it that way. But it's becoming clear to them that they are only seeing dimly. They don't really get it. Jesus sees that too. He do, they don't really get it. We don't understand fully. They're starting to realize that. So what does he mean by leaven? Leaven of the Pharisees, disbelief in false teaching. Beware. Here's another continuing verb. Stay awake, stay alert, don't go to sleep. Be, be alert all the time. Keep on your guard. Leaven of Herod, worldly goods. From a worldly perspective, the disciples' concern for bread was real. Keep on looking out. Stay alert. Don't let your guard down. The pessimism of the disciples indicates their lack of faith. Concern for literal bread was unnecessary. Think about it, disciples. If I fed thousands twice with five and seven bread cakes, do you think I could feed us all? Uh, don't you think I could feed us all with a single bread cake? Why, I could do it without any bread cake at all. We must ponder and take to heart the words and works of Jesus, dwelling on them prayerfully. Ferguson says, this is the yeast of unbelief, and beware of it. Their unbelief was like yeast, affecting everything in their lives. They were discontent and worried and anxious and frustrated, brought about by their unbelief. He questions the disciples. That's the Socratic method of teaching. This is great teaching. Get the scene. It's so powerful, so intimate, and so close and, and, and intense. It's great teaching. It's coaching. It's probing. It's developing his disciples for the mission ahead. This is true shepherding. With what you've seen me do for the crowds, can't you trust me to take care of you too? Remember on the stormy sea, the disciples said, Teacher, don't you even care if we drown? That's the same kind of unbelief of the Pharisees and the Herod, and, and, and of the Herodian, and of Herod. The refusal to lead to the tender mercy of Christ, the desire to hold on your own life and rule it instead of letting go of your life and relying on the rule and provision of the Lord. Unbelief is like leaven, small and apparently insignificant, but silent, invisible, pervasive, and powerful in its influence.
Sproul calls false teaching, and that's the leaven he's talking about. He calls it a poison that can kill us. It's a poison that can, it's invisible. Once it gets in that, it changes everything about it. It changes the appearance and the characteristics of just as it. They're worried about bread. Jesus, the incarnate bread of life, is talking about faith. He's teaching his disciples just as he is teaching us. So, how's your hearing? How's your sight? How's your understanding of the gospel of salvation by grace through faith? In the sacrament to come, we'll gather to remember Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. We'll eat bread and drink wine as a sign and seal of the truth of the teacher's lessons. In this sacrament, we cling to faith in His promises. We're strengthened, we're emboldened to live out our faith in this fallen world. And in Christ, we have plenty of bread. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time. Pray, Holy Spirit, you will um, nourish us uh, with the bread of life uh, by even reminded and uh, stimulated by the uh, sacrament we're about to enjoy. Use it powerfully to build our faith. Use it powerfully to encourage us, strengthen us, give us wisdom to live out in powerful ways the gospel as we have come to understand it from your teaching. We pray gratefully in Jesus' name. Amen.